177,000 people each year in the UK alone that go missing. What can I do as one person? I can share the stories. Collectively, Collectively we can share, we can the, share, share the stories. There could be big pieces of information, small pieces of information that we can all put together. Solving these cases and helping to find these missing children, women, men. With that said, join me on this missing case that I'm going to cover and let's see if we can collectively shed some light on what happened. The disappearance of Jeanette Tate. On the 19th of August, a warm summer's day in 1978, Jeanette was 13 years old and living in the village of Aylesbury, which was about 10 miles east of Exeter. She had been born in Taunton, Somerset, and then moved with her family to Cornwall and then Devon. Her parents, John and Sheila, had separated, so Jeanette had gone to live with her father and his partner, Violet, and Violet's daughter. She was a pupil of Exmouth Comprehensive, about 10 miles from where she lived. Her dad called her Ginny, and the family said that she really enjoyed going to school and that she was pretty incredible at maths. She loved animals, she loved composing poetry, writing, and was just a really curious girl, you know, about all that went on around her in the world. She was described as a bit shy, but this other inquisitive side of her and her interests helped her to overcome this shyness. There was nothing particularly unusual about the 19th of August on the day that she went missing. Her dad had left 7.30am in the morning to take Violet, his partner, to work. He reports that he arrived home at 10am to make the girls breakfast. His stepdaughter Tanya was preparing to go on a fortnight's holiday with her own father and the girls popped off together beforehand to the local shop for some sweets. At 12.20 it's reported that John drove Tanya and her boyfriend to catch her coach in Exeter leaving Jeanette home alone, where she was never to be seen again. Jeanette set off from Barton Farm Cottage, where she lived with her dad, his partner and her stepsister. It's believed sometime after 2pm to deliver copies of The Express and The Echo Paper. This wasn't Jeanette's weekly job she was covering for a young lad who was away at the time um, and she was just covering for the week. She rode her blue bike through Aylesbury, I think that's how you pronounce it, correct me if I'm wrong, along Witham Lane and out onto the busy A3052. This was a main road connecting Exeter to Sidmouth seaside town. It was quite busy with holiday traffic that day. Outside of the White Horse Inn, she collected her bundle of newspapers to deliver that day and set off to begin her delivery round. This was actually meant to be her last day of delivering the newspapers for the young lad that she was covering. By 3.15pm, Jeanette had travelled about two thirds of the way along Withan Road and she had managed to deliver about 14 newspapers to people's houses. As she was approaching a small bridge, she met two of her friends, Margaret Heavey and Tracy Pratt. Three girls chatted away happily together and started to walk back towards Aylesbury. Jeanette was pushing her bike along up a slope and when she got to the top of the incline, she jumped on her bike and cycled ahead, probably to go and deliver some more of the papers. Maggie and Tracy reported that Jeanette stayed in their vision for about 
50 meters until the country lane bent out of view. It was the last time that Jeanette's friends would ever see her. Her friends said that about five to 10 minutes later, they came across Jeanette's bike in the road, but Jeanette was nowhere to be seen. The bike was on its side and there were newspapers just spilled everywhere. They began to call her name over the hedgerows and into the fields, but there was no answer. There was absolutely no reply. The girls picked up the bicycle and went further up the road to speak to John, Jeanette's dad, to explain what had happened and to say that they couldn't find her anywhere. They all went out looking together, again, looking over the hedges and through the fields and shouting at her name, you know, really getting worried and concerned now, but nothing, no reply. She was nowhere to be seen. Violet, her stepmother, had suggested that they best now call the police because this was really unlike Jeanette and they were all really concerned. It was the beginning of a missing persons search and it became one of the biggest and longest ever mounted by Devon and Cornwall police. And they all actually responded really fast. Within a couple of hours of Jeanette's disappearance and the report being made, uniformed officers were in the village and an RAF helicopter was flying above in search of Jeanette. For days, for weeks, for months, they searched the fields, local woodland, anywhere that they could think of. Missing posters were put up everywhere in local shops, on lampposts. Superintendent Eric Rundle was put in charge of the investigation. Nobody at that point came forward with any information as to Jeanette's whereabouts or if they'd seen anything suspicious. They thought of every possible scenario, but all came to the conclusion that it was likely to have been an abduction. As always, with any missing person, you know, child case, it's those first 24 hours that are vital that they are found. Jeanette was described on the missing posters as five foot tall with short styled brown hair. She had a suntan and was wearing a t-shirt with her name Jeanette embroidered on the left hand shoulder. She was wearing white pimpsoles that day. The search was coordinated from the local village hall with daily briefings, which was only a stone's throw away from where Jeanette lived, Barton Farm Cottage. 48 hours later, still no sign of her. Everyone was growing really concerned. Then came what at first appeared to be a breakthrough in the case. Mrs. Matilda Rogers, a policeman's wife from Hull and her 14 year old daughter, Gal, were on holiday in Devon and were staying in a cottage that was based on Withan Lane. They came forward and said that shortly before Jeanette's disappearance that they had seen the girls in the lane. They also said that they had seen a man in a car. Gal explained how she had been walking back that day to their holiday home in Withan Lane when they'd seen the girls at the bridge. As they were walking away, that's when they'd seen a man driving in a maroon colored car. It had been heading towards Withan Lane in the direction of the girls and would have passed the girls as he drove by was he connected to her going missing? This was the most credible information they had gathered yet and became the main focus of the investigation to find this man. Others weren't so sure that this should be the main focus of the investigations, but police said this is the best evidence and information that they had to go on so far. The maroon car was described as possibly being a Triumph 1300 or do you say it for 1300? I don't know. I don't know anything about cars. Possibly a car with fins and the man was described as quite young and smart looking with dark hair. 
DI Mike Walsh and his team then went on to start questioning local sex offenders. But they couldn't get any further information and any connection between them and Jeanette on the day that she went missing on the 19th of August. On that day, Jeanette's father said, did she want to come with him? But Jeanette said she hadn't wanted to go. This is his last memory of his daughter who was sitting on the lawn at Barton Farm Cottage playing with her puzzle book. He said that day he then went on to collect a violet from Exeter, ate an ice cream in the cathedral yard and did some shopping. He waved Tanya, his stepdaughter, off at the coach station and staff at the Dingle store department could confirm that he had been there as they could remember him buying a plate to replace another plate that he had previously broken. As in all investigations, unfortunately the nearest and dearest have to be included in the questioning because sadly it often is someone close or known to the child or person responsible for them going missing. There was a huge press covering of Jeanette's disappearance through the local newspapers, national newspapers, television, thousands and thousands of people that came forward to help in the search for missing Jeanette. There were even paranormal investigators and mediums and clairvoyants, you know, that came forward, but they could bring no new fresh information and help in finding her. Police were convinced that someone had abducted Jeanette. They stated that the most likely outcome was that she had been murdered. In 1990, a man was arrested in the Scottish borders after he had abducted a child. He was labelled a monster for his truly heinous crimes. Black had a delivery job and was up and down, you know, across the UK. This gave him the perfect opportunity to commit crimes in different locations and get away with it. Well, for a short time anyway. The crimes had been committed in the 1980s and all of them had huge similarities to Jeanette's case. He was a paedophile and a murderer. Black was arrested and convicted of the rapes and murders of the other children. He was questioned about Jeanette's case but never admitted that he had anything to do with her disappearance. Police were pretty adamant that it was him. It's highly likely that it could have been, but there's also a chance that it could have been someone else. In 2007, Devon and Cornwall Police presented a file to the Crown Prosecution Service, pushing forward to bring charges against Black for Jeanette's disappearance. Unfortunately, the courts came back and said that there was not enough evidence to pursue this. He had gone on to murder again and they had hoped to bring the file again before the Crown Prosecution Service in an attempt to prosecute him with Jeanette's disappearance. Another child had gone missing on 12th of August 1981. He struck while this girl was cycling her bike to a friend's house, so very similar to Jeanette's case presenting vehicle receipts. I'm thinking maybe they mean petrol receipts, um, something along those lines. At the trial, it put Black in the right place at the right time for Jeanette's disappearance too. This bolstered and strengthened everything for them. So they was about to present a file once more to the Crown Prosecution Service. Unfortunately, they were five weeks away from presenting the file to seek prosecution of Black for the murder of Jeanette when Black died in prison. Although the full police case against Black has not been fully revealed, it is stated that a witness claims to have seen Black acting suspiciously on August the 19th, 1978 at Exeter Airport, which puts Black in the southwest at the time of Jeanette's disappearance. So there is every possibility that it was black, but there is every possibility that it was someone else. It could have been another local sex offender. It could have been someone she knew and trusted. 
did you live in the area at that time? Did any of your family live in the area at that time? Were any of your family or friends witnesses that we'd meant that I've mentioned in this story? Maybe you were looking out your window that day and you see something that you thought would be insignificant. But it's often these smaller insignificant pieces of information when put together can build the bigger picture and help us solve this case and bring Jeanette home. Please share this story as a collective and never forget Jeanette or her family. A man named Mr. Brady is adamant that Black is not responsible for Jeanette's disappearance. He claimed to have seen a man acting really suspiciously. He was in the Tucker's Arms in Dalwood, which is about 28 minutes away from where Jeanette lived, two days after Jeanette vanished. He describes the man as about 30 years old, dyed black hair with bushy eyebrows and blue eyes with little flecks in them. He was wearing a white shirt with rolled up sleeves, black trousers and brown shoes. Brady said that he was acting like a cat on a hot tin roof, you know, looking around all suspiciously. He'd also noticed that he'd parked his car on the corner and not right outside of the pub like most people do. He also matched the description perfectly of what they put out in the newspapers. Mr Brady also said that the police had got the car wrong. It wasn't a maroon triumph, dolomite, I think that's how you pronounce it, but a chocolate-covered Alfa Romeo spider, which was modified and had a vinyl roof with low wheels. Mr Brady even had a conversation with this man that he felt looked a bit dodgy, and he said that he also had a feeling that he was in the armed forces, although he was stating otherwise. He had reported this information to the police, but the police felt that there wasn't enough evidence linking this man to the case or to prove that he was involved, so didn't pursue it. I don't know about you, but looking into this case just leaves me with more questions than anything else. Like, was there any damage to the bike that she was riding? I can't see anything written about that. Was she knocked off her bike? Was it truly some kind of really bad accident and someone just panicked and then put her in the car? On researching, the police had said that Black, who they think killed Jeanette um, and abducted her, had a white van with the windows blacked out with black curtains. Now, the lady that was holidaying with her daughter who'd seen Jeanette and her friends that day just before she went missing, they described seeing a man in a maroon car. Or did Black own any other cars? Had he rented a car that day from somewhere else? More questions. What area did Black live in exactly? I'm looking up and I'm seeing, I'm sure it's London. And um, I know it was the South. But where exactly did he live, his home? Because all of the other victims, it seems from what I've read, he just dumped the bodies and they were found. If he had abducted Jeanette, why didn't he just do the same with Jeanette? If it was him, maybe he wasn't able to take the body back with him or dump it in another area. I'd, you know, it's just really confusing. So maybe that does open the door and the possibility of it being someone else who had abducted Jeanette that day and not Black. His other victims had been found and he hadn't exactly kept that a big secret. So why would he deny if he had kidnapped Jeanette? Why would he deny having kidnapped her? What would be the point with all the others that they knew about? So how can you help? You can share the story. You can ask questions. You can research. Was you or anyone that you know in Devon... Exeter or around those areas on the 19th of August 1978 holidaying visiting family anything like that 
Maybe your grandparents lived there and you popped to visit quite often. Maybe you were working that way at that time. You popped into the Tucker's Arms in Dalwood. Or maybe your dad or granddad was a long distance lorry driver, so would often frequent those areas and the local pubs. You could ask them because the tiniest bit of information could help unlock and solve this case and bring Jeanette home.